developers, 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 otherwise known as DevX5, where we onboard with new developer tools, developer products. I am your host, Ian Jennings. This is my co-host, Chris Chinchilla. And today we're looking at Gitpod. And I need to make a couple of apologies. I am not in my normal setup, so it's probably not that great. And there's actually a huge storm has just started. So, <laughs> so, so my echoey room is also being added to by a huge wind that I can see happening just in front of me. So, yeah. <laughs> Which is why it's also Today we actually have a special guest, right? We do. We're going to look at Gitpod, and I'm going to bring in um, Mike now. And here we go. We'll adjust, do some... Uh, I think that's... Eh, let's go for that. I think that's, that's more egalitarian. <laughs> so it's Mike Nichols, yeah? Or... Perfect. Yeah, that's the right pronunciation. So maybe um, before we dive into the developer experience and kind of getting hands-on, what was the initial justification or motivation for creating Gitpod? Yeah, so thanks for having me. I I work at Gitpod, um, joined early this year, and basically what happened was that we, we're all familiar with, with setting up our local development environments, you know, once and then twice and then every time for each project. And then you start switching between projects and you have to change Node version, Java versions, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So where Gitpod comes in is is the reason we built it is we want to make sure that we don't do all, any of that. We automate all of that that tedious work that you have to do repeatedly. And this is where the uh, the automation comes in, where you configure your development setup once, and you know every time you start up in a workspace, it automatically creates all these scripts for you, runs the dependencies, installs everything, even starts up servers. And that that was really the, the main key there to to remove the friction for maintaining and setting up a local development environment. Okay. And what's happening behind the scenes? I mean, where would this sit in the kind of equivalent tools that some people might have around containers? Um, I know like Visual Studio Code also has this uh, remote session, is it? I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Like there's a few existing tools out there that are, and even I think now GitHub is part of Microsoft and Visual Studio Code and they're kind of the same company. They have something a little similar-ish as well. I think they're testing. Is that is it all part of the kind of the same world, like a browser cloud-based environment that you can just get as and when you need to work in instead of having to keep doing it yourself? Exactly, yeah. The, the idea here is to... Um, Instead of having one environment that you maintain over a long period of time, we do the same as we did with servers, right? We used to log into a server, <laughs> SSH, git clone. Um, and now we, we discard servers, you know, as we don't need, we spin them up and down all, all the time. And, and Gitpod is really bringing that to the development environments. We, we call them ephemeral development environments. So if you have a, an issue in GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, you basically spin up a development environment for that issue specifically. Mm -hmm. You do your work oh, okay. and then you shut it down. All right. So one thing you have to do every time you open it or you want to work on an issue is create a branch. Now, if you open a Gitpod environment from a GitHub issue, Gitpod automatically creates a branch for you with a, with a name that makes sense. And you do your work, you open a PR, and then you basically get rid of your environment. You never look at that again. The other thing, the other thing that happens is in that space, and and um, yeah, we're kind of pioneering that at the moment, where we have a concept of pre-builds, mm -hmm. so that you know, if you have a build process that takes 10, 15 minutes to compile um, dependencies and and your project, all that happens every time you do a git push to your repository. So every commit that you push kicks off a new pre-build that runs all that build process. So by the time you start your environment. Your dev server is already running. Everything's good to go, and that really saves you quite a bit of time, especially when you start to switch between contexts. Coworker comes over and is like, "Hey, I need a PR review." That's really just a new tab in your browser. Clean environment. <laughs> okay. yeah. So it spins up environments in the cloud, essentially that replicate the repository's requirements, or so, so that I don't need to pull to review. I need to pull to my local machine to review some pull requests and run, you know, install the dependencies. Instead, 
it's a tab and it's a cloud. Sorry, I haven't used the product yet. It's a cloud. Yeah. Editor. Well, yeah. 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 So it's, it's VS code um, in the cloud. That's, that's basically yep. it. Yeah. How, how smart is that? Like how much do I have to do, have set up in a repository um, or is it, do you just auto detect a lot of kind of popular and common configurations? Yeah, good, good question. So by default, if you have no configuration, then you just get the environment VS code at a ter terminal at the bottom and that's all you get. And then you can just run it like you do locally. If you do add a git pod.yaml file, then this is where you can configure your pre-builds, mm -hmm. what you want to run in, for, in advance, what you want to run later. Okay. So that, yeah, you can make it as there smart would, as you want. Yeah. There would be hooks for some common build systems like gems, NPM and things like that though, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Everything is based on a, on a Docker file. So you can use okay. one that we provide that has everything installed, or you can go build your custom Docker file and then basically say that, you know, these are the packages that I want. So if you have a security team in your company, they can, you know, narrow that down to only the packages and, and tools that they want their developers to have installed. That's kind of how you can go around that. Yeah. What do you think, Ian? Any other questions or should we just dive straight in? Yeah, I want to talk about the problem. Uh in a larger scope. So the problem that we're solving is essentially that it's it's a pain to to pull someone's branch and, and replicate the environment. Because I know personally, yeah. when I got started as a front end developer, I remember I signed a contract and it, it took me a week or two weeks in order to get um, their Mac environment working on my Windows machine at the time. <laughs> and they were like, what's going on? What's going on? I didn't want to admit that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to admit that I was translating all this stuff into Windows and I was trying to get it to run on uh, whatever that XMPP, whatever that package is that's like, you know, PHP MySQL thing. I was trying to get all their stuff and then I think they had an elastic search and I just mm -hmm. couldn't get it running. So is that what we're trying to solve essentially that replication issue when you're, uh, you know, having multiple environments and then, and then also like on that note, um, with the, the rise of like localized hardware. So now that computer is getting a little beefier locally, like how do you, I see kind of two competing forces there, you know, like, um, I guess I'm just curious. Yeah. Like if that's a problem and, and how you see it. In, in, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, the first thing you said is, is exactly the problem that that's solved now. The, it works on my machine that that's no yeah. longer a thing yeah. because everybody now has the same machine. Um, and you know you get you get whatever cloud resources we we provide. So there's 16. Like it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, we we can configure that um, in terms of how much memory, how much RAM. But the other benefit you get is that when you're when you're doing a, like an npm install or or uh, downloading Java packages locally, you really rely on the bandwidth of your internet connection. Okay. With, with something that runs in the cloud you're already up there and, and have a way higher throughput, right? So downloading these packages is significantly quicker. And and all you really need on your local machine, and that's what you mentioned second, right? In, it's yeah, exactly yeah. against, like I, I had a Chromebook for two years and I had absolutely no problem developing any code. Mm -hmm. I, I ran, you know, Kubernetes applications in the cloud, all that. And yeah. people people use iPads. So that's, you know, you don't need okay. a, a two or $3,000 laptop anymore to develop software. Ah, uh, you can just run it you on, just a, need on an a internet server. connection, and this is actually one of the negatives That's I find right. of services like this. I like the ability to be able to work offline, yeah. <laughs> which is where things, you know, they, they it doesn't suit every use case and every person. Although it's funny you mentioned this yesterday. Yesterday, I think it's been a long couple of days. I was <laughs> attempting to do some experimenting with Kubernetes for something. And I found myself longing for the days of just FTPing into a server <laughs> and uploading <laughs> files. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, oh my God, this is so complicated. I just want to, you know. Um, and I do remember those days of uh, LAMP and XMPP or whatever. Or yeah, LAMP whatever. Windows. I think XMPP is a protocol, <laughs> yeah. but it was something like that. Yeah. Vagrant. And, yeah, know, Vagrant. Vagrant was in there. Kind of yeah. filled the gap for a while. Yeah. Um, and were fantastic for the time but they were incredibly weighty <laughs> i think uh, especially with vagrant on the machines you had in those days it was kind of a tremendous amount of overhead <laughs> um yeah should we dive in um i think we should go for it yeah i'm i'm picturing it in my head now and i'd like to see it <laughs> I'm doing a little experiment i get the feeling what i'm about to do is something very basic and then maybe we'll take it from there well, what are you about to do really 
<laughs> kick the tires for you, Mike, because I'm going to use Safari just to <laughs> just to try and break things as much as possible. <laughs> you, you want to try to make me nervous before I even get started. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what's your role at like, Gitpod, by the way? My my role. Um, so officially, I'm a developer and customer success engineer, which is you know helping our okay. users um, get up and running and and spread the word about Gitpod. All right. So. I did have a quick experiment earlier. I'm going to go, let's actually just go to the, um, to the website. I think every, oops, yeah, I need to, this is, I stupidly decided to only use one screen. I'm going to switch to two <laughs> screens and get the window of us out the way. Hang on. <laughs> That's probably a much better idea. There we go. Less screens of infiniteness now. Okay. So this is gitpod.io. Um, the nice thing I liked already was that um, you've kind of recognized where people are going to be beginning from. Um, I also like the fact you put GitLab first, which is kind of an interesting decision. Maybe we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> um, I am going to use GitHub, though, just because I, it's where I have most things. But the couple of things you do, which I quite liked, was um, you can sign in, but you also have this prefix thing. And this is the stumbling block I hit earlier because I kept seeing this and I tried gitpod.io slash my repository URL. Um, then I tried gitpod.io slash uh, hash slash, and then I realized you actually literally mean put that in front of the normal URL. <laughs> so, so I was, I kind of couldn't believe that that was what I needed to do and that was mm. what I needed to do. So what would be a good, um, test kind of project I might have, Mike. That was the one thing I think I'm still wondering, like what would be a good project for me to maybe try this with? And I'll see if I have one around. Um, it, it can be really anything, to be honest. If, if you have something that you're working on at the moment, um, you know, a, a project or... Um, okay. How about yeah. a simple React application? Would that be a good one? That, that could work, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um... I did try with a Jekyll website earlier. Oops, that's that's my personal website. That's not what I wanted. I wanted uh, GitHub. <laughs> but I'm going to try with a React application. It's a bit more self-contained, maybe. This is a very strange um, uh, website. Don't pay too much attention to it. It's actually based on it. It's a <laughs> thing for a game I made. Don't pay too much attention to it. Don't worry, I have my own game <laughs> repository too. We can do mine if you like. Uh, there we go. So I take this. My theory is every developer secretly wants to be a game developer. Yeah. And we're just well, it was an excuse for me to learn React and it's because you haven't touched it in a little while. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone, this is kind of small to actually, I can, um, yeah. So it's literally. Oh, okay. I would have deleted the hash. That's well, just, so, I, I did all sorts yeah. of things, but this is what you actually need to do. <laughs> you, you don't need the slash, but you do need the hash because that's where mm -hmm. you get the fragment in the URL. But, okay. So even yeah, so, that is okay. That is, yeah. Now, I'll zoom out again. One other thing I've just remembered whilst this is happening, I've got this new tool that I keep. Oops, no, something went wrong there. Oops. No, I do need it by the looks of it. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. One other thing I'll just quickly do whilst we are waiting for that to build is I do actually now have something that highlights my cursor and I'm so, mm. such a new tool for me to use. I keep forgetting to enable that. Uh, there we go. Okay. So we have Visual Studio Code. This actually looks a lot like my Visual Studio Code, except a bit lighter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that is pretty much as I'd expect. That's pretty, that was fast. pretty straightforward. This is a fairly simple, um, project to be fair. Um, one quick question I wanted to ask actually, can I add custom extensions here or? Uh, yeah, just just like you do locally, if you go there, um, you can search for extensions, install them. Now you have, you have two options, you can install them on the user level, so you get them for each yeah. project you work on or at the project level where it then means you get it for everybody who uses that project will get that same extension. So. Is this VS Code uh, server? The um, it's the open source VS Code repository that we forked and made a few changes to it for uh, the backend okay. part. But it's it's the official VS Code 
um, as you as you get it open source. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This, this is actually an, this is actually interesting as well. So this is an extension I maintain. I know this is not correct. So I don't know if this is just the install count on. Like oh, so Python, which, which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can explain that. So basically, what happens yeah. is the marketplace of VS Code is proprietary. Yes, I and know, this is to, called OpenVSX. We've, yeah. we've had to release um, different versions of the extension for people who want to that, use open variants of VS Code. I know that's I where know it comes from. Baseball it. stuff here because of this extension. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. intrigued to know if this probably won't work because it actually requires a Go binary to be running. But it's just out of interest. Okay, so I've got my environment. I mean, what can I what can I do? What what I can obviously code. I can review. But what else can I do from here? So anything you do locally, really, you can you can do here. Um, anything you have in mind that that you're like, if you want to create a branch, you could do that. Um, this is all at the moment without any um, Git pod config file, right? This is really yeah, just sure. spinning it up. If you shut that down, then start it again. You get a new environment that starts from scratch again. Okay. Mm. So for example, so this doesn't so persist on refresh. No. Not, not at the moment. This is like ephemeral. So you could, if you yeah. want to, you could start it again. Like the workspace could be restarted through the um, UI, but that that's against the whole concept of, of ephemeral development environments. So what we really need at some point is creating a Git pod YAML file to um, automate the process of setting that up. And then you don't need to persist things anymore because it'll just you know run these commands on every new environment. Uh, is there anything specifically you would want to keep persistent? Um, there's probably ways around it, but things like extensions I wanted to add here and stuff like that. Could I also do that with the config file? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a, a section in a second, in maybe just uh, purely out of, I also like the fact I'm getting the menu here and this is in Safari. So yeah, it's cool. <laughs> so, so that's, yeah, but I could set this all up to run automatically, I guess. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Maybe we should actually, um, do that. So yeah. Um, if I want, you know, you mentioned about um, creating a pull request and then being able to just review that straight into Git into Gitpod. How do I go about setting that up? I mean, is there a document that tells me, and we can maybe just step that through? I guess. Um, so to to review a pull request, you really need to do nothing other than opening. Um, git pod with a git uh, hub URL of a pull request. So there's okay. a concept of a context. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you open a um, GitHub issue URL, then that context is recognized and it creates a branch. Mm -hmm. If you open a PR URL with git pod.io slash hash and then the git pod, a GitHub URL for a PR, it then recognizes that you want to review a PR and it gives you all these features to review PRs and leave comments, things like that. Look at that. And I have a pull request here. I don't really want to dig into private um, URLs of projects just in case. <laughs> <laughs> this is obviously something I've also not looked at for some time. <laughs> and JSON output. It's actually adding JSON output so I can um, create an Alexa skill. And then I never did it. Oh, cool. But anyway. <laughs> One of those things so, that seemed very innovative two years ago, and now it's probably a bit late. But. So while, while this is creating the environment, what's happening now is you get a new environment like completely from scratch. So you can see the URL is different to yeah. the workspace you started up previously. And then once it's up and running, you'll see that we have a new um, icon on the left side for the pull request review. And then we can go in there and do something. Mm. So this is really handy. Well, like, imagine you were working on a feature, um, and then your colleague comes over or, or pings you, and like, "Hey, I need a review on this PR." You don't have to stash your changes, switch the branch, pull down the code. Yeah. Uh, you you really just open a new tab, review the PR, and if they have newer versions of dependencies for that PR, you get all that out of the box without messing up your local environment. Okay. And do you mean just this here, or is there a different one I should be looking uh, at? If you go to the bottom one, the last one there with the um, Octocat. Ah, with the Octocat, of course, yes. Ah, huh. mm. okay. You do have to tell who you are. Yeah. What are some uh, big companies that are using Gitpod? Big companies? I think one that I can talk about is, is Pulumi. <laughs> um, Okay. So Pulumi, uh, it's uh, similar to Terraform, but, but with more code and uh, like, Co code based and it's a lot, lot more flexible. 
they they use it for their uh, workshops. So anybody who wants to learn Pulumi, they can spin up an environment. Saves you all that you know initial yeah. student setup stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's it seems like with a lot of products like this, like I, I actually work on a similar product um, that's screen recording with code, and it always comes back to learning. First, it always comes back to like I think that the major pain point um, of getting these environments started is usually one for newbies, um, but also it's for uh, it's usually because you're quickly context switching, like someone who is who is. Um, an experienced developer is reviewing someone someone else's code, right? And so there's always this dynamic of like teacher and student happening uh, when you get into with these products, which I think is um, I don't know. I think it's interesting that it always just comes back to education. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Would you say that's common with your um, with with like I mean uh, with a lot of the clients? Like I, I'm imagining like developer advocates probably love this too. You know, I see them moving toward like code sandbox and such. Yeah. Um, to totally agree. I think for even for open source projects, this is something that I focused on in the last couple of weeks. Where if you want to help people onboard and do a real quick yeah. bug fix, instead of reading a contributing.md or or a getting started section in the README, there's a button you click it, um, you start it up. So, yeah. Especially when it comes to like documentation or just like changing a string in the app, right? And you want to verify that it work works. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's now working. Okay, cool. Um, this is a, a Jekyll website. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, this is where we see what is actually available. Uh, <laughs> I hope if I spelt it correctly. <laughs> does it scan the repo? Like, so when you when you clone the Git repo, does it scan it for? Um, like it just detects that it's that it's a Ruby repo, or detects that it's Node, and then installs it npm, or are they all installed on every uh, on every Very instance? Nice. Yeah. So uh, what do you get right now? The underlying Docker image is is um, what we call the workspace full, and that's basically mm -hmm. has everything installed. So it's it's okay. Docker, Go, everything in it. Uh, if you do it your custom one, then you can slim that down and and only install what what you need. Um, what about but this versioning? Is, uh, if there's like NVM eight or oh, sorry NPM eight, sorry Node eight, Node twelve, like does it come with like ten versions of Node as well, or is that? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's it's one version by by default, but this is then when you come in and you create your own um, yeah. Docker file and, and say like I need eight or twelve or whichever you need. Yeah. I'm getting an error here, but I will say that I have a lot of weird stuff in this website, so. <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling I know what this probably is. Um, this uh, recently, um, a lot of the one of the main extensions in um, this is getting a bit off topic in uh, in Jekyll and Ruby for generating images switched from Image Magic, which used to be quite common, to something new. And I'm getting the feeling that you're missing that dependency, which is not surprising. <laughs> Um, mm. But I'm not 100 percent sure. But I wouldn't worry too much. That even took me quite a lot of time to get working on um, services like Netlify and things like that. So mm. um, I wouldn't be surprised if that was uh, the problem there. So I wouldn't worry too much. Should we try to run the the um, React server that you had, the game? Yeah, let's pull that back. Um, I think I closed it, but um, oh, did you? I, but this is this is perfect though. I, yeah, closing it and and. <laughs> Bringing it back is exactly what we should be doing. So. <laughs> what happens on the back? <laughs> do, you, do you count interactions and then close it? Do you just destroy the instance after some time? Like, does it last for some amount of time, like seven days or? Yeah, after a while, it, it gets deleted. I think it's 30 or something. There it um, is, yeah. You, you can go to your dashboard and the default filter just doesn't show it, but you can change that to all and then you mm -hmm. see the previous workspaces. Uh, we, we have, yeah. you know, we see so people. Oh, here that, we go, that, yeah. 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 So it recognized that there's one running already. So that's yeah. why it's asking you if you want to reuse it. Sorry, I, what did you want to say? I interrupted you, I think. Oh, um, I guess that, yeah, that was smart, right? So I'm, I know that sometimes these can be expensive. I, also, I worked on a similar product at a company uh, a few years ago. Um, and one of the issues we had was the expense of spinning up the servers um, was just 
I don't know. It was it was a tough problem. So I'm I'm curious about you know that was like a really smart move, right? Because if you just had launched a new one, you just keep refreshing and. Although it's yeah. taking a little bit of time to reopen, but um, yeah. By the way, if you if you prefer the um, dark theme, you can you can change that through the settings, and it'll actually remember it. So. I actually uh, I actually prefer I'm a, I'm one of these crazy people that prefers light in the day, dark at night. Nice. Um, but mm. my own editor is just not quite as bright <laughs> it's not it's not dark but it's not quite so light <laughs> um so i mean i did in yeah it's still there there we go cool um and i haven't ran this for such a long time i can't honestly remember what the uh command is there we go start probably actually i'm interested to see what's going to happen if i run this Will I get the URL to to look at the output? I'm not sure. Let's That's see. what I've been curious about the whole time. Is potentially, so, <laughs> but being React, this is going to take a while. So hang on. <laughs> Be right back. <laughs> this is the fun. Whenever I do my hands-on stream, and I always have to do um, npm or Kubernetes projects. This is like, okay, I've got time to kill. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm just going to run this for. Oh no, let's let's do it. So in, it's more that I can't remember exactly what the script is. <laughs> I think it's script start. I can't actually remember. It's been so I think, it's just I think you can start. just NVM start, yeah, okay. for that one. It's been so long, I can't honestly remember. And I apologize, I, I keep zooming in, but for anyone who's trying to follow, but every time I get a new window, it resets, and I don't always remember. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. Ah, interesting. Mm. Preview open browser. Oh, cool. Wow, browser. In the browser. Uh, in yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> browser in what? the browser. Why not? Okay. Oh, pop-up window blocked. There we go. Oh. Yep. Okay. So this is my curious game. <laughs> <laughs> but it is working. The Most of the React stuff is down... Is here... Uh, so maybe so... What, what what that did basically is it exposed um, port yep. uh, three thousand and gave you a public URL. So yep. if you want to have you know your colleagues look at your dev environment, you can just share that URL with them. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to do like a accessibility linter or whatever run on your page, you have a yep. public URL that you can use. Yeah, cool. and link checking, I suppose, because often that's done on yep. the HTML side. Mm. That's nice. Yeah, the yeah. preview. Host I mean. Should work as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot going on here because I'm thinking about all the tools it would take yeah. locally, like ngrok and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, browser. What about developer tool? Uh, I guess you wouldn't use developer tools in this view. You'd probably want to pop it out. Yeah, you, you want to like I usually have a separate tab open um, just yeah. next to this one, and then I can flip back and forth and um, nice, nice. Look at it after. Um, <clears throat> I mean. Okay, yeah, good. I actually do use a US keyboard, but just to, <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> I also, as you can probably see here, have a fairly aggressive amount of ad blocking going on, and it's all working. So, uh, chat, I'll chat with you. Okay, um, cool. I um, I would like to investigate how to um, create this uh, config file you mentioned. So yeah, we can do that. Let's, I've got so many. Years. So far, this has been too easy. There's a, <laughs> it's just worked. <laughs> what have we got here? So a quick look. So the okay, that was uh, so fifty hours free. No oh, hours. Thirty minutes. Time. So it's not too bad, especially for an open source developer working uh, spare time. That's yeah. is that is that individual though? Oh, it's open. Is that for a project or for a person? It, it's it's per person. So you get you get fifty hours on. On the public that's, repos. That's probably um, probably enough for many people working on open source projects. Ah, interesting. Whilst mm -hmm. whilst I'm just digging around this, maybe um, yeah, what was the what was the thought process in putting uh, GitLab first there? <laughs> oh, initially, um, yeah, I wonder. I, I, I'm going to say there was probably some thought about it. Um, the <laughs> I guess one one thing to to mention is that GitLab. Now it does have a native integration yes. with Gitpod, yes. so mm. if if you go to any GitLab project, there's a button um, open open in Gitpod, and that does exactly what uh, what we just did manually. It opens a new tab with the prefix for that repo and starts it up. Um, so 
One quick question that's coming into my mind right now. Uh, so I have this open in my, on my master branch. Yeah. If mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a change right here, I, yep. I can do it the same way. Yeah. And it would get still committed back into the repository because I gave it all the right permissions. Th that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It has a, a GitHub token that it knows who you are. Mm. You can interact with your Git repo just like you would normally. Let's do that. I already saw here that, I mean, this is basically roughly yeah. what I'm looking for. Not that, completely. Exactly what it, yeah. Not exactly, but pretty similar. <laughs> so a yarn, I think, is fine. Yarn. Yeah, yarn is there. Um, I can run the same scripts with, with yarn. I can run with NPM, I guess. And it's 3030, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Uh, 3000, I believe. 3000. Um, on open, is that, um, yeah, so the, the documentation is actively being rewritten at the moment. So if you don't find it easily, then that, no, no, that's no, probably this, 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 this part here, what's, what's that o on open, open preview. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you go back to the, um, editor, let's see if you get, if you delete, um, open preview and do a control shift, let's oh, see if you get a preview of what's available. Control shift. Uh, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so basically, there's different ways to um, open the web application once it, the server starts up. There we go. Oh, there mm. we go. Okay. So you can open a browser or a preview. So this you can do it for each port. You can also ignore it. You can do certain things. But um, that's just telling Gitpod whether what it should do for that port when it recognizes that it's available. So I think. That's... And there's the image that we spoke about, the workspace full. Line two, exactly. If you yeah. drop that, then you get what's in the comment above. Yeah, that has everything. So in theory, normally, um, if I just check this out and that file already existed, it would run all this, but that, as I've just added correct. it manually, is there a way to just run it manually now? Yeah, what, so the, the process at the moment to do that is we have to, I would commit it to a branch because okay. you know, you may, you don't know if it's actually going to work. Um, so I would, I would create a branch for that and then push that up to GitHub and then open that branch in a new Git uh, pod repository or Git pod workspace, and then it'll kick it in. So that, that has the added benefit of the repo or the workspace you have right now, you can go in and make edits without, you know, locking yourself out if you have a bug or something in the script. I don't actually usually use um, Visual Studio Code for committing so i'm kind of like how does it work <laughs> <laughs> so i think that went through let's just um if anyone likes very surreal role play games then you can you can check this <laughs> one out but uh, no that didn't seem to what did i forget to do i think i forgot to do uh, you may have pushed the branch oh let's see Push. Oh. To push. Yes, there we go. Hmm. Yep. If you want to create a PR right from here, there's a button there as well. You could you could do that too. Yep. There we go. Mm. Is this your own? No, this is from GitHub. Yeah, it's, that was my first thought. Yeah. I use an external application, so I tend to just always use that. And even though I yeah, know yeah. I could just use Visual Studio Code for now. All right, let's close okay. this because this is not what we want to do. What we want to do is there we go so you have a i know you probably don't have one for safari but you have a browser extension don't you so i don't have to keep remembering to copy paste yeah this, it, i think yeah it, it just adds <laughs> a, a button to uh github or GitLab, whatever and, and you can just click that and but really all it does is open a new window with the prefix of it still, it still so. saves a few seconds. <laughs> it, it does. It does. <laughs> what, what you can do is um, you can create a bookmarklet in, yeah. in your browser and just execute JavaScript that does window.open. Um, so let's see with what that. This may fail, but that's okay. It's interesting to see what happens if things fail. So, Definitely. Um, there's the file. So far. So the file is there. Now let's see in the terminal once that that kicks in. Yeah. There we go. It's doing a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I shouldn't have picked React. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Now, one one thing we haven't done yet is we haven't um, configured the pre-builds. That's why when you start the environment, that's when it starts kicking off these these steps. Once we configure pre-builds, then what happens is the init step that you configured actually happens in advance. This so, is nice. So, um, for example, okay. one use case I can think of, um, or I could kind of do it in um, in GitHub, to be fair, but this is kind of nicer. Um, so this, this extension I showed earlier is a language linter for checking English language. Um, but often the view in, in GitHub, i.e. just line, line, line problem, line problem, line problem, line problem is, is kind of not really how people think when they write. So the ability to kind of open up here and people to be actually see like squiggly lines like they used to in a, in a text mm. editor is possibly overkill, but kind of could be nice. I don't know. <laughs> it might be too much, but it's kind of nice. So, so that worked. Yeah, that worked perfectly. Excellent. That was, as Ian said, almost too easy. (laughs) 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 It's not enough to complain about Ian. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Any other questions, Ian? Or or maybe we should see if there's anything we've missed that we should cover. What do you think? I don't know. I'm trying to. It's. It seems like everything works fine. I'm impressed that the the cloud VS code. um, Everything just seems to work perfectly. Honestly, I'm curious. Like. I mean, I know this is not kind of out of scope. Like I'm, so I'm working on an Electron, you know, video application. And I guess, you know, more broadly, like how do you see, um, do you like, in, do we see like in like coding moving toward a cloud environment in, in general, or like, is this more of like a, uh, use case based thing, you know? So I did what I've seen recently over the last year or two is that i mean if, if you look at, at larger organizations Git, google facebook um they, yeah. they already have something like that they're just internal um mm-hmm. you know cloud-based development environments so i think this is i think this is a trend that that we're going to see increasing over the next couple of years because everything else already happens in the cloud like we we plan yeah. on the web and then and then we pull the code down locally we do some stuff and then to test it, we push it back up into the cloud. So this is really the only, like writing code is really the only thing we still do locally. And and I think this this is going forward and, and you know, the security aspects that come with it where you all of a sudden yeah. have control. If somebody loses the laptop, their source code is not lost. Like, I think there's a number of reasons that it's gonna be interesting to companies to, to start thinking about that kind of way of working. Mm. Um, and and uh, a lot less. Personally, I think it's a lot less cognitive overhead for for developers. Like I haven't done mm-hmm. a Git stash in yeah. years. And uh, yeah, it, it's also I think about it a lot. I mean, I the, you know what, one of my uh, consulting company does is essentially tests developer experience, and it, the the problems are always environment based. Yeah. They're always like, oh, I didn't, you know, I, you told me to install this version of uh, this Maven package, but it was outdated or whatever. And you would think that these companies would just have a thing, hey, try it out and launch the browser. Um, but I, I also see this like, um, I, I saw this stat somewhere, it was like nine out of 10 devs would prefer their own IDE. So it's, I think we're in that transition phase where we're like, let's customize the VS code to be exactly what we want on the cloud, you know? And like, it's sort of basically like almost, almost there. Um, but I also, you know, we've just been stuck in the local environment for so long. Um, I don't want to give up my local environment yet. I like <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah. So we, we, I mean, this this is something that you know people recognize, and we, we do too. So there's we have something called a local companion app that yeah. lets you actually connect to a Git pod environment from your local host, and you know at least have a first step, and then later maybe you move. Um, the other thing is that you know you get a versioning of your development environments which currently uh, on local host, you don't have that that much, right? Mm, mm. Um, you make changes yeah, and then it's like, yeah. oh, what did I do again? And then your coworkers yeah. are like, I haven't run a script. And so here everything's in Git and, and you can just go revert things back if it fails. And How do you feel about like um, third-party tool integration? Like for example, a lot of developers use Postman, right? And as part of their workflow, or maybe you use like Wireshark or something like, That's something where I see, you know, this works for these small um, pull reviews, but the moment you want to go do something like that, uh, what do you you think about like those those other tools? 
Yeah, that, that that's where you know the, the closer integration with your local environment comes into play. Um, yeah, that, that local companion app. Uh, it's, it's basically just going to open ports and, and let you connect back and forth. Okay. Um, so that, that'll that make things a bit easier. Yeah. Um, that, so that that's, I think it's it's, it's something we need to build and, 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 you know, it helps with the transition as well. Same for databases. Um, like I, I know um, Drupal developers, for example, they have a local database with their content. I, that is um, what I used to be. And that was when my experiences of Vagrant and things were. So, <laughs> yeah. So you, know, you want to have that database with your content and then you want to test that against multiple versions and patches yep. and things like that. Yep. So having that is going to make things a bit easier too. Yeah. There's just for certain use cases, I think that makes sense to have something On locally. That, uh, uh, another use case I was just wondering because when Ian mentioned Maven, I was thinking about mm -hmm. developers that have to build binaries. Um, is that something that's feasible or not really with GitPod? Bin that's like what what kind of binaries? Generally, that should be okay. Like you could do C plus plus and and things like that there and as what, well. Where would the binary go? Like if it, say it had a, a visual front end or something like that. Oh, okay. So what you could do is we have another workspace um, Docker image called Workspace Full VNC. And then oh, right. you actually can spin up a desktop environment <laughs> in the browser as well. <laughs> wow. Then it gets really it gets really meta. But I actually use that for I don't know if you guys know Cypress, uh, the the yes. end to end yes. testing. Yeah. testing it for yeah. um, something at the moment. So yeah. yeah. Nice. So I, I use that to because of the the way you have to develop and test your tests, you need a UI for it. Yep. And I use the the VNC uh, environment for that, so I can spin up. Cypress in that environment, and then I can have Firefox running there as well, and and you know test that out. And so I get you you get a GUI there as well if you use that other Docker. Is that something you're going to offer even the open source developers? I could feel it, fear that could be quite easily abused. <laughs> um, I mean you can do it now. Like the, the VNC image yeah. is, is public. Okay. It's just dash VNC. It's, it's, uh, but it's, it has to be Linux, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the images. At the moment, anyway, yeah. Most of the time, fine, depending what you're working on. Of course, if you're doing something that needs Xcode, then this is no use to you anyway. So Yeah, no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and there was one other thing that came into my mind a minute ago. Um, but I can't remember. Um, yeah, I think actually it's pretty, pretty solid. Um, I haven't really found much that has confused me. And you um, used Safari. Yeah. <laughs> Safari, yeah, it's great. Yeah, Safari's not that bad. It's fine. <laughs> it's well. um, I think it's pretty much it. Yeah, it was. Um, it was really straightforward, and everything worked. Yeah. I don't know what to say about it. Yeah, just um, make sure you put that hash in the URL, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The only DX, the only DX friction is the. the hash. <laughs> I would put a, I would put a paste your GitHub URL. Input instead of saying uh, just use, just put this in front of it. I would say paste the URL and then give it to them. That's the, that's the only thing I would do. Oh, on the website you mean instead of yeah 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 yeah. yeah. One just paste it in this in. case because you talk about education and I know VS Code has this extension built in. Could I in theory um, have a, a shareable URL um, but with certain permissions on or something like that? Mm. For your workspace, you mean? Although to be fair, I know that even the oh, VS Code sure. one, I think everyone has edit, edit rights, don't they? I think from memory, so it would be the same here, I guess. If I gave that URL, yeah, to you someone. can. Yeah, if you, there's a way to share your workspace to do live collaboration with yeah. other people, and then they just have the same permissions as you do uh, at this yeah. point, anyway. Which which has stung me in the past, but that's the you just have to trust your audience. <laughs> I was about to say, you got to be careful who you share it with. I mean, that that's just a matter of implementing a read-only yeah, mode. But yeah. at this time, it's yeah. it's the same permissions as you. Do. But that's so that's because I saw you you got a link there about screencast. That's um so that's a potential thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. Um, what's what's next on the roadmap? I mean, uh, it's it's one of those applications that or one of those uh, tools that I quite like in that I'm sure there's a lot of complexity going on behind the scenes. But yeah. as an end user, that was pretty easy. So, but I'm sure it took a lot to get there. But what's next? Um, yeah, there's there's a couple of things coming. I mean, we we are a very open business, so our roadmap is is fully public. Um, our internal documents, well, how we work is a lot of that is public as well. Um, so what I mentioned is uh, one is the the local companion app. That's that's a, a big step. Um, the other thing we're working on is a way to use your local VS Code to connect into a GitPod environment. Mm -hmm. 
so that you know <laughs> pe people who really like the local environment um we we accommodated for them as well <laughs> i see excitement so that that's good um, that's, no, that's definitely something like that. that we're focusing on i do quite like that and i actually have an actual use case for at the moment where for some reason so the main company i work for is a go code base and i'm endlessly having um version module version mismatches in my local vs code because i have to keep right. running things and then the environment gets out of sync and stuff like that and it's it's a minor inconvenience but it annoys me and this <laughs> would kind of resolve that <laughs> it would yeah nice nice Anything um yeah so that's that's coming and you know there's any other thoughts in no i, I want to try the companion app now i'm curious um about it and I, I don't know, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I uh, oversaw a project, uh, I managed a project with like 10 junior devs and was doing polls every day and I could have totally seen it being useful there. Because mm -hmm. um, I do remember a lot of stashing, cloning, pulling, review, like that kind of thing. Um, I wish we had seen what a merge or like pull, re pull request with like a diff kind of looks like in Gitpod, but I can imagine that it's the same as VS Code. Yeah, it is the same, yeah. Yeah, and you can leave yeah. comments and things like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pretty. I mean, it's it does seem like a remarkable amount of work on the back end and uh, really easy on the front end too. So it's yeah, it's really good stuff. How, how old yeah. is the company? Uh, the product is about two years old. It was spun out okay. of a different company before that. So the the team behind it, they've been doing that for many many years. Um, they also built Thea, so the the editor uh, that we had previously. It's the yeah. same the same people behind that. Wow. And now it's, I think the time is right and, and you know, the market is changing. More and more people talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's fairly, yeah. And it's a Kubernetes application on, in, in the end. It's mm -hmm. a bunch of services that communicate together. So. It's kind of funny because it just makes me think of my, my computing programming at courses 101 at university. We're using terminal services on a 68,000 microprocessor. So it's like we've gone full circle. All the yeah. Way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's just infinitely more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that server was in the same building, not somewhere else. That was the main <laughs> difference. And that, that was a little old fashioned at the time. I will, I'm not that old. It's, it's, <laughs> they did it on purpose to kind of um, show you oh, how it used to be a little. That was only the early 2000s. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. All right. Um, Thanks, Mike, for joining us. That was super interesting. You were our first guest. I don't know if that. <laughs> Thanks for um, having me. If that. <laughs> clouded us stumbling around in the dark or not but we'll see i don't know um <laughs> thanks for joining us and um yeah ian i don't think we haven't quite decided what will be the next one but if you want no some, but um, uh what happened last uh, last time we just said hey if you want to be on the show let us know we're <laughs> great starting to bring on guests and developer tools i think we're just um, deciding about two days before so yeah that's fine <laughs> yeah if you uh uh hopefully your product will work just as well as mike's did because <laughs> that was super smooth and it's like normally we're, we're all over the place like like oh chris did this and that why did they make this decision the docs are over complicated but like here it just was super smooth yeah. if you've got um, something really complicated that doesn't work most of the time we'd love to yeah yeah <laughs> 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 so, great all right do you want to sign us out yeah. again that was uh, DevX5, also known as developers, 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 developers. We will be back in two weeks with an unknown guest and an unknown product. So um, like and subscribe, stay tuned, follow us uh, on everything. Yeah. <laughs> Signing out. This was Christian Trillo, Ian Jennings, and Mike Nicholas. Mike Nicholas from Gitpod. All right. <laughs>